scary stories to tell in the dark. If you've been around an elementary school library on Halloween for the last 30 years, then you're probably familiar with Alvin Schwartz's legendary series, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. In fact, if you're hearing my voice right now, it's probably because you read these books at some point in your life. If I had to guess, I'd say no set of books has minted as many lifelong horror fans as scary stories. Stephen King or Bram Stoker might have been an argument, but scary stories has the advantage of access to the minds of very young children. Too young, some have argued. Scary Stories was famously the book that sent parents running to their kids' libraries, screaming for censorship. So how did a collection of folk tales, dark nursery rhymes, and urban legends become so beloved by children and so reviled by their parents? What's the secret? For starters, urban legends and folk tales are not like normal horror stories. A child sitting down to read a juvenile edition of Frankenstein or Dracula knows that what they're reading is a work of imagination. Imagination can indeed be frightening, but nothing, even a child knows, is scarier than reality. Urban legends are rarely, if ever, true stories but they are presented as if they were. As the old framing device suggests, it happens to a friend of a friend of mine. These are stories of things that could be happening right around the corner to normal people just like you. So when a story starts with, One dark, rainy Saturday afternoon, a fat, jolly butcher named Samuel Blunt had an argument over money with his wife, Eloise. Blunt had lost his temper and killed Eloise. Then he ground her up into sausage meat and buried her bones under a big flat rock in the backyard. Or the timber wolves around French Creek had gotten out of hand. Is a child really supposed to think that these stories aren't true or couldn't have happened? Quite the opposite. A child has probably observed his parents arguing over money. She may have heard or have learned firsthand that wolves on a farm can be a concern. So no matter how strange the tale is, its presence in the collection makes one think, even today, that there had to have been some kernel of truth to it. In part, the appeal of these books can be explained by the way they present young readers with glimpses into aspects of reality that the adults in their lives are trying to protect them from. Urban legends and spook stories, in this sense, carry a kind of suppressed knowledge. This is bolstered by the fact that more than any other work of juvenile literature, Scary Stories relentlessly confronts the reader with the tabooed topic of death. One of the more interesting urban legends I've encountered on the internet comes from South Korea. It has to do with a woman who's followed from her building's elevator all the way to her apartment by a man in a yellow hat and rain jacket. A man carrying a long knife. The story ends with the detail that later she sees the same man on the news. It's a serial killer. It's the serial killer, Yu Young Chul, who's responsible for over 20 murders in real life. The significance of finding this story on a website called Scary for Kids wasn't lost on me. It was the old scary stories formula again. Take the darkest aspects of reality, boil them down to tasty bite-sized morsels, and feed them to kids. Indeed, many of the stories in the collection have to do not with ghouls and ghosts of any sort, but common acts of crime. Think of Sally, who sees a mafia hit job keel over in the subway with a, quote, bullet hole in the side of his head. The message in so many of these stories is that adults are oddly pernicious creatures 
capable of the worst behavior. Ask yourself what lessons a child could learn from a story like that of the cat in the shopping bag. Miss Briggs feels bad about running over a cat on her way to the mall. So she puts the cat in a bag and carries it away in order to give it a dignified burial later. A nice plan, until another woman reaches into the car and steals the bag, thinking that it's full of Christmas presents. Miss Briggs follows the thief long enough to see her get her comeuppance, in the form of a heart attack. But on top of all that, she lies to the paramedics to make sure the dead cat goes along with her to the hospital. What spiteful, dishonest creatures adults are, is what a child must think. And then, of course, there are those stories that are just plain weird. Look, for example, at the sheer number of stories that are about somebody who's hearing voices or sounds in their head. Ellen had just fallen asleep when she heard a strange voice. Ellen, it whispered. I am coming up the stairs. I am on the first step. Now I am on the second step. Ellen got scared and called her parents, but they did not hear her, and they didn't come. Then the voice whispered, Ellen, I am on the top step. Now I am in the hall. Now I'm outside your room. Then it whispered, I'm standing right next to your bed. And then, I've got you. Ellen screamed and the voice stopped. Her father rushed in the room and turned on the light. Somebody is in here, Ellen said. They looked and looked. Nobody was there. Stories like that, and there are several, shift the theme from tales of death to tales that make one question the very nature of reality. How many kids reading that story must have asked themselves, is Ellen crazy? Am I crazy? Kids do have a tendency to see and hear things that might not be there after all. But maybe it's not as serious as I'm making it out to be. Ellen had just fallen asleep. She was dreaming, right? What then do we make of Lucy Morgan, the artist who wanted to spend the day painting in a small country town? That night she dreamt of a strange woman with pale skin, black eyes, and long hair. A woman who told her to flee while she still could. Lucy changes her plans, but alas, she cannot escape her fate. The next day, she finds herself in the exact place she had dreamt of. And how about poor Rosemary Gibbs, whose mother fell ill while on a trip to Paris? The doctor sent Rosemary to find some medicine, but when she returned, nobody could tell her where her mother was. Nobody would even acknowledge that her mother existed. Are you sure you're in the right hotel? I remember being disturbed by that story in particular. To seven-year-old me, it suggested that reality could change cruelly on a dime, like a giant Rubik's Cube, ever shifting, snatching people into the darkness of its folds. The footnote at the end wasn't very comforting either. Because if it's true that Rosemary was only being lied to by the authorities to avoid creating a panic, you still had to ask yourself, what happened to her after that? So yeah, these books were kind of disturbing, and a kid reading them was left with the impression of death and darkness lurking everywhere. But at the same time, maybe there was something even more basic than that. Life is Weird. Strange and unexpected things can happen at any moment. And yet it all seems to make sense in some darkly poetic way. Because we're all part of it. Perhaps that was the lesson that Scary Stories was trying to teach us. If so, nothing made the point clearer.
than the illustrations. Alvin Schwartz is a fine writer and folklorist, but if there was a genius at work in the creation of those books, it was surely Stephen Gamel. Schwartz selected stories that brought death to the forefront as an ever-present reality, but it was Gamel who filled the book with charming corpses in various states of decomposition. Look at his illustration for The Bride, for Christ's sake. It's nothing short of death staring you in the face, with her wedding flowers blackened and her body reduced to bones. Her expression seems to say, but we were only playing a game, you know. Life can be cruel and short, and Gamel's illustrations drip with the juices spilled when the check comes at the end. But what are all those splash marks at the edge of every picture supposed to be, anyway? Blood. Bile. The sludge of decomposition. Or are those nerves and synapses we're seeing? If I had to put my finger on exactly why these illustrations are so powerful, it would be because they seem to bridge the material realm of the body, its blood and flesh, to some kind of metamaterial from a world beyond our own. The woman with pale skin, black eyes, and long hair, she looks like something out of a dream which, of course, is exactly what she is. I'm half convinced they made that movie a few years ago just as an excuse to animate her. Looking at his work, you'd think Amel had to be a fan of Salvador Dali. A few of their pictures seem to exist in a shared universe. It's not surprising that when the publishers decided to release the book with new illustrations, the old fans did not take kindly. What were they expecting, really? The new illustrations by Brett Helquist were lovely, but they certainly wouldn't give anyone nightmares. They were, at the end of the day, only drawings. Gamel's pictures, on the other hand, have the presence of ectoplasm seeping right out of the reader's own skull. Or maybe we're all just aging now. And looking back with nostalgia at a series of books that we couldn't imagine our childhoods without, I certainly can't imagine who I'd be if those books had never entered my life. My love of books was kindled by them over 30 years ago. Really, it's a shame Mr. Schwartz didn't live long enough to see just how profound an effect he'd have on generations of children. But then... That's just the kind of cruel twist he seemed to relish. <laughs>